You also talk about the dangers of hallucinations and choosing the the right quote unquote job to be done by sure. AI solutions. Getting hallucinations is really a fancy way of saying you may be a little bit surprised and you may get a little bit inaccurate results, but you have to check it because it's very convincing. Welcome to another episode of the Optimize Podcast. Today, we'll delve deep into technology and AI adoption, exploring the common hurdles and uncovering actual strategies to navigate these challenges. The pace at which technology is evolving necessitates a robust strategy for adoption within organizations. And that's what we aim to unravel in today's discussion. We have a distinguished guest who has graciously sponsored this episode and brings a wealth of knowledge to the subject. Today's guest is Fergal McGovern, the CEO of Visible Thread, and Fergal has worked extensively helping organizations become more effective with technology and AI. His journey, spanning over three decades, reflects a blend of visionary leadership and practical insights that have significantly impacted the tech adoption landscape. The ethos of Visible Thread resonates through Fergal's endeavors, offering a clear lens to view and navigate the complex tech terrain. We thank Fergal and his dedicated team of Visible Thread for their support and sponsorship of this episode. Fergal, we're thrilled to have you with us here today and look forward to hearing your insights. Great. Nice to be here. So it's been a while since we've had a chance to kind of meet in person. Um, it was a, it's been a very great year for Visible Thread and obviously technology. Um, so reminiscing about the inception of Visible Thread, what pivotal moment spurred you to embark on this venture? Wow, how long do we have, Tom? Um, it's a great question. So if I reflect back to the early parts of my career, uh, one of the things that I had the misfortune or perhaps fortune to be involved in was working in the context of large organizations, large enterprises, you know, very large banks like Bank of Montreal. Uh, I spent a lot of time in the U.S. Uh, working primarily in the 90s. And what I would often see is wasted energy and time and miscommunication going on, particularly when important content, like for instance, business or technical requirements lived in documents. So there was a lot of friction, a lot of inefficiency. And really what drove me to kind of start Visible Thread is to aim to provide a better way to assist discovery and finding uh, key requirements, support requirements such that you avoid risk and you improve efficiency of review. So really it's all about document review, making that as efficient as possible and helping normal people who don't have time to get involved in tech. When I say normal people, I mean the people involved in business use automation for that purpose, but in an easy way. Yeah, that's quite a universal theme and challenge that I think a lot of businesses have, regardless of the industry. Um, so yeah, we, we see that on this side of the pond here too. Um, in, in a lot of the things and especially in the government sector too, there's, you know, government contracts tend to be very, um, very tight in time and cost constraints. Um, so I think some of the solutions that you've provided, I, I think really do help our industry particularly, um, to kind of help, uh, maneuver some of those challenges. And that's a great point because I think in the context of kind of government contracting specifically, um, the pressure, the time pressure to actually digest content, you've got a very short window of time uh, to both digest a, an important solicitation. You may even have, you know, six, eight weeks, um, go through hundreds of pages, make sure that you're compliant, make sure that you've got the appropriate risk profile, make sure, in fact, that maybe it's inappropriate to even bid on a certain opportunity. So in that context, a lot of, you know, kind of long hours are part of the, uh, the equation and there's a lot of burnout and so forth. So what we find with our customers is that when they apply automation in the right ways in the right, for the right tasks, that it can significantly alleviate the, um, or improve the efficiency is probably a better way to put it and also improve the likely outcome, which of course for our customers is to win more business is to be more compliant and, and therefore uh, deliver on their promise to their shareholders. No, absolutely. And I think this is even more pivotal too with the onset of 
the larger GWAX and the larger IDIQs, these task orders, I know for a lot of our customers, are 10 less days um, to respond. Uh, and without any type of automation or templates and things like that, it just really wouldn't be you know, possible in order to do that. So, but that's, that's quite the journey. Um, and with like the AI landscape rapidly evolving, how do you perceive some of these advancements influencing or shaping the technology adoption realm? So AI is yet another layer of kind of consideration when you think about automation in, in the environment. And I think there is a kind of a rush. It, it's like pretty much every hype cycle. I'm not suggesting that generative AI is a hype cycle, but with every kind of new innovation, the internet itself, um, the advent of the smartphone, AI is of a similar kind of stature. And the situation that's most important to keep in mind is that AI has been around an awful long time. It's the generative AI type of AI that is new. Um, and that is something that's very good at certain use cases, certain jobs, and it's not so good at other jobs. So to make that concrete, uh, generative AI is not so good at mathematical jobs. So if I want to reliably, you know, do something in tech land, like read and write to a database, so user management, for instance, you would never use generative AI for user management or for workspace management or for parsing out a Microsoft Word file, but you would absolutely use it for other jobs. So for instance, summarization of text, the creative element of writing good proposals, that's where generative AI can really shine. So I think when you're thinking about AI and the advances, it's important to be a little bit more considered and not rush into situation and maybe avoid some of the, or at least consider some of the products that are effectively just, you know, thin wrappers around a large language model, which is the engine of, of generative AI. So there are a lot of new products out there who claim to deliver all kinds of Nirvana and, you know, silver bullet type outcomes. Just be a little bit careful of those. And I don't say that as a vendor. I say that as a vendor who's been 15 years building product, uh, invisible thread. And sometimes technology and engineering takes a long time. That's just the nature of it. You can't do things yeah. overnight and suddenly deliver a robust solution. It is. And un unfortunately, we're a society that is so into the immediate, like, how can you solve my problem now? And how can I go to one place to kind of solve that problem? And I'm super critical myself about um, really thoughtful adoption of technology um, to really go back and do the homework of evaluating what are your needs, what is the problem that you're trying to solve. And obviously, if you do find a solution or a tool that supports or can help, you know, at the enterprise level, at a more global level, then, then that's great. But you do really have to understand first what you need and then understand exactly what it is that you, you are trying to adopt in order for those two to be successful um, or even to have those within your organization want to adopt it or understand why they're adopting or, or you know, trying to implement a new technology. It's, it's that whole um, why are we doing this element that I think always kind of gets missed sometimes. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. And I think it, it's not that we're suggesting that you should be kind of, you know, overtly analytical about this stuff. But when you step back, there, there's a lot of budget right now available in large corporations. And effectively, the budget is coming from the C-suite. And it's basically, look, go get us onto AI, generative AI. And a lot of that money is going to be spent and wasted. And some of it will be spent wisely. But the biggest thing that people should keep in mind is that ultimately, why do you adopt technology in the first instance? It is to make things more efficient, more productive, better outcomes. So it's a combination of efficiency, improvements, and, and better quality outcomes. So if you can kind of map whatever it is you're looking to do to the core sets of problems, which is back to boring old business process analysis. It's kind of what is your as-is state and what is your anticipated future state? And let's try and map the technology, irrespective of whether it's AI or standard automation. It doesn't really matter. Let's try and map it back to those individual steps. And that way you can measure success much easier and avoid the idea of flushing yeah. cash down the drain. No, no. People are, I think there is a mass, you know, movement to throw money at things. And, you know, just like everything else, you can't throw money at stuff and make it better. So 
Um, so true. But, you know, you and I are on LinkedIn a lot. Um, I, I think it's been, LinkedIn has been a, a blessing and a curse, let's just say, right? Um, at the same time, everyone's talking about technology and AI and adopting, um, you know, their tool, that tool, or, you know, this solution. And there's a lot of, you know, trust but verify type of, you know, challenges with LinkedIn and with, um, you know, with everything that, that we're reading out there. You don't quite know what you're reading is, you know, is, is true. Um, you've pointed out a lot, and I love following your your posts because I, I feel like I get so much smarter, like every time I, I, I read those. But you've pointed out that that merely introducing new technology isn't going to be, you know, like we said, the panacea for many organizations, you know, that what they're hoping for. Um, can you expand on some of the like common pitfalls that you've encountered when companies try to adopt new technologies? Yeah, um, there's kind of certain patterns. It's like everything changes and nothing changes. Human beings are human beings and, and we all kind of, you know, we all have the same advantages and the same quirks and the same kind of set of things by and large, irrespective of whether you're talking about 30 years ago or you're talking about this decade, it doesn't really matter. So the biggest challenge in adoption, adopting, excuse me, automation is a human challenge. It's fundamentally that people overestimate the ability for normal employees, typically in organizations to absorb behavior change. Because the biggest issue is a behavior change issue. If you adopt new tools, if you introduce new stuff, new, oh. new ways of doing things, you're going to get the bell curve of life. You're going to get people who are way ahead of this and really embracing it on one end. On the other end, you're going to get the naysayers, the people who reject change and are not good with change. And that's okay. That's, the, you know, they're people. And then somewhere in, in the middle, you're going to have people who, you know, have a normal life who don't, you know, they, they work, but they work to live and, and they're not going to spend um, a lot of time engaging. So when management looks to adopt new technology, they really need to consider it from an adoption standpoint regarding the behavior change that's required. So how does that look in practice? You need to get buy-in. You need to have people bought into the idea. You can't just drop new products or new technology in and expect it to suddenly magically work. So education, training, not training where you basically say, okay, we're going to send everybody in the organization off for three days and they're going to kind of sit in some classroom format where it's old school kind of, you know, some lecture, lecturing. And it's got to be a much more refined approach to training. It's got to be choosing individual groups, typically those groups and organizations that you think will actually adopt this fastest and will lead the way and will set the template out for correct and good usage. So then it can start to trickle down. So I'm dating myself now, but it feels like, you know, trickle down economics from Reaganomics back in the day. Right. But, but there's a lot to be said for the idea of actually getting the best people. That doesn't mean the most senior people. It means the people with the best acumen, the people with the best vision about how this might work, getting those people involved and then trickling down those learnings, which are now specific to the organization's way of doing business. Because a lot of time vendors will wander in and, you know, consultants will come in they won't really know the business. Yeah, I mean, they're slick. They've got PowerPoints. It's all good. It looks good. C-suite likes it. It feels good, but it fails. And you can have a colossal waste of money. Uh, you need a proper kind of program engagement plan, um, a change management plan. And ultimately, it's about people embracing this new technology. Um, the second thing that's really important is that you've got to measure benefit. You know, if you're doing a 180-day plan for a change management uh, program or a 180-day, you know, kind of, I, I like to do things in tight increments, so I would divvy it up into, you know, 30-day increments. First 30 days is going to be whatever, understand it as is process. Second 30 days is going to be getting our kind of key stakeholders involved, getting people start to, you know, use the solution for real business objectives. And then you start to layer in more and more depth. And that's great because you get early warning signals at that point. So big bang approaches rarely work. It's much better to incrementally approach the entire adoption process. Yeah. I think you said a couple of things that really kind of resonate with me is the fact that um, I think with any type of new technology adoption, new process, whatever it might be, that you're always going to have people on different ends of that bell curve. and. Yep that that's okay. 
Um, I think a lot of times executives measure success as to how many people are on board or have adopted it. And so I think it's sometimes, it, you know, until you roll it out, and I like your, you know, roll it out, you know, small and incremental and within an organization or a functional area where I think it will have the most impact um, or it's going to be more heavily used where you can see benefits earlier. I think that will help show what some of the key performance indicators of what success looks like. And with that said, though, success within one functional area, within one organization, is going to look very differently than maybe somewhere else. And sometimes executives like to broad brush uh, success in one area and think that they're going to be able to replicate that somewhere else at that same level, the intensity or the same um, utility. Maybe they're looking for a percentage or hours or whatever of you know use. Um, it, it just doesn't translate like that. And that's that's OK. And that still could be viewed as success. Um, but I think you need to know how and what you're measuring first before you can kind of go in and, you know, set that set that measurement or try to claim success. For sure. Yeah. So, you know, uh, I, I know when you when you talk about adoption and, and everything, you you also need to stress the need for heightened security. Um, with AI adoption. Can you talk to a little about um, security and elaborate on that? Yeah, so security in AI is kind of a, a really important factor, particularly when you're dealing with regulated industries. Um, and again, I don't know if the awareness is out there to the extent it needs to be. When you're looking at vendors of software, and I guess I can speak from that point of view because that's the area that we swim in, there are an awful lot of vendors out there particularly ones that pop up in the last you know, short period of time, let's say between one and three years, who are promising all kinds of stuff and who are kind of not necessarily keeping in mind what it takes to deploy software in an enterprise setting. When you deal with information security folk in an in a enterprise setting, they have legitimate and valid concerns about the content. And the content, typically, they don't want that content going outside of their firewall. Now, that's a tech way of saying it just has to be 100% locked down. If you think about defense and space, you think about IT services, financial services, healthcare, you just don't want that going into the public internet. So a lot of companies will set up private clouds for that exact reason um, in defense and space or in, in kind of more, you know, situations where you've got CUI considerations and you've got, you know, skiffs going on and whatnot. The, these private clouds are really your kind of your entry point. If you're using LLMs, large language models, which are fundamentally the engine of generative AI, if you're using GPT, for instance, which, you know, OpenAI was the first to democratize the whole uh, generative AI one year ago, actually, with GPT and ChatGPT, once you put that content into a GPT type large language model, it's basically violating the security stance and posture. Because you don't know, there's, there's a number of factors here. You could be training inadvertently, but that's mostly locked down now. I think most of the large language model guys have kind of got options for that. But effectively, your content is going outside your environment, and there's a compliance implication around this. So you don't know if non-nationals are going to be able to somehow interact with that software or that large language model. And the reason, you know, a lot of the kind of intent of the... Uh, executive order from Biden, um, which now is about two or three weeks old, whilst we can debate the ins and outs of why it's good and why it's not so good, but the intent was a security intent. Um, so what do corporates need to do? I think they need to have a checklist. They need to ask the vendor, where is your LLM living? They need to understand, will their InfoSec people be able to deploy that LLM, my view, and this is our stance as Visible Thread because we are very conscious of our security posture. It's one of our big differentiation points. For the last 15 years, working with the top defense contractors, for instance, we've always you know, nailed our colors to the mask. Security is the number one priority for us. That's why we are deployed into SCIFs. So for us, you need to deploy an LLM, which is completely isolated. It cannot be trained. It should not be leaking any data outside of the firewall. And the chief information security officer needs to be 100% comfortable that that is the case. Yes, there will be evolution very quickly in the next six months, 12 months around security. 
But I think in this industry, in this business, you, you just can't take chances on your content, your proprietary content. You just can't do that. Yeah. I, I, I think, fortunately, unfortunately, um, the cybersecurity industry is going to be uh, very successful um, and, and, and very profitable for uh, decades. Um, just because every time we do introduce a new technology, every time we do introduce something new within our organization, that increases our vulnerabilities tenfold. And then it makes security even more complex than what it was before, right? Um, again, not to date myself, but I remember when we used to fax data, uh, you know, yeah. to to other Me companies. Too. I or, was there. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and then it was even more secure because you would phone and call someone and then right. emails and um, all of that on the uh, World Wide Web kind of made, you know, um, working in this environment even, you know, more difficult. So, again, we've some of us have lived through several uh, life cycles of this. And so, too, we shall overcome this. We just need to kind of stay smarter um, than those who are, you know, trying to um, to kind of uh, find those breaches and stuff like that. So, um, you know, you you like so let's take a pivot but from security, because I know we could talk about security and scare, you know, all of our listeners for for hours on, on some of those challenges. But, you know, you also talk about the dangerous hallucinations and choosing the the right quote unquote job to be done by sure. AI solutions. Um, and I think that's that's such a great way of of coining that is the the job to be done right, and that's that's really kind of an interesting take on it. Like, um, talk to me a little bit more about that because I think a lot of people think that uh, you know AI and certain technologies is that one hammer that does everything. Um, it's just one tool in in a toolbox, but it does yeah, have so its pros I, and cons. For sure. So I think this is maybe you know it's going to be a learning opportunity for people to understand what large language models are, what AI, generative AI is, what jobs it's good at doing versus what jobs it's not so good at doing. So so if we kind of strip it all back and we say, well, what is generative AI? And I don't want to get into a PhD about kind of you know, AI in general, but fundamentally, generative AI at its core is a predictive, creative technology. You know, if you think about the good use cases, the, the places where it plays, it's creating new content based off a massive training model where it can actually, you know, be quite impressive. People in the early days of, of ChatGPT, people were, you know, doom and gloom naysayers, you know, the earth is going to end because this thing can think. It can't think. What it's doing is it's got a bunch, a huge corpus of, you know, stuff in that model. The entire internet is fueling the model. And it's predicting what is the likelihood of actually sequencing a number of words back to you in response legitimately to your question. So it appears very compelling. It appears very convincing. But what you get back, you have to verify. So it's trust but verify time. And we, of course, as professionals should always do this. So the good use cases, you know, summarize this piece of content, uh, create a first draft of a, of a blog post or create a first draft of an RFP. That's all good. But you would be remiss as a professional to believe that and to actually solely depend on that. It's kind of, you know, again, believing in silver bullets. It, it's it's Cal Cuckoo Land stuff. You use it to help you speed up your process. You use it for the right use cases. You do not use it. You know, I, I saw this actually friends of mine uh, in the early times of LLMs, which is only like eight months ago. Um, I had one particular friend who was coding against this to give him back in technical land what's called JSON. JSON is an underlying way to uh, represent data. And he said, this is great. I'm going to speed up you know, that entire bit of the product I had to do using traditional approaches. I don't need to do that anymore. My LLM will just do it and it'll be so easy and blah, blah, blah. The problem with that is that the LLM is what's referred to in computer science circles as non-deterministic. If you run the same command a million times, you will not get the same outcomes because it's generating the content. And if the model changes or if something changes in its tuning, which you can, then you get a different outcome. So getting hallucinations is really a fancy way of saying you may be a little bit surprised and you may get a little bit inaccurate results, but you have to check it because it's very convincing. Um, my favorite okay. example is I asked three LLMs, 
how many words are in this sentence? Very simple question. It seems simple, right? And the sentence was, in fact, 45 words. Bing gave me a 35-word answer, saying there was 35 words in this sentence. Uh, Bard gave me a better answer, which was, I can't give you a good answer because I'm an LLM and I'm not very good at giving answers for math-type questions. Well, that's so And then ChatGPT, which was appropriate, exactly, but it knew yes. it wasn't so good at doing that thing. And ChatGPT gave me 47 instead of 45. So it was a little bit off, but not too much off. So now, if I'm a person going into a... Um, you know, going into the DMV for, for whatever it might be, and I'm relying on a system to give me accurate answers for questions, I better hope there's standard software at play here that gives us the right answers 100% of the time, every time. LLMs are not guaranteed to do that. But they're very good at creative type use cases, text summarization, photo filling in stuff, diagnostics, predictive stuff, that is just enough for the job at hand. So for me, it's all about this job to be done. Again, it comes back to the earlier part of the conversation. What is it you're trying to automate? And maybe it's appropriate to use standard software. Maybe it's appropriate to use LLM type software, or maybe in reality, it's appropriate to use a, a hybrid. You know, in our product, we, we use a lot of AI, but not generative AI. And as we look in our kind of roadmap, we will be layering in a lot of generative AI would be very considered about the job it will do for us. And there are times and places where it's really good at doing certain things. So I think it, it's not a binary question. It's a question of understanding what this stuff is good at and what it's not good at and making your judgment and then mapping it back to the process that you're trying to automate. Yeah, exactly. I, I love collecting examples of hallucinations. And I've heard yeah. you talk about that before, you know, the, the word count. And I'm going to put it into like my list of examples to kind of provide other people. Um, but I've got a hallucination uh, story myself too. I was, um, it's, uh, it's very good for creating resumes and being able to summarize. Absolutely. And, and it's very compelling. Um, it's probably one of the most compelling writers, you know, I've ever encountered. It's like, it's actually convinced me sometimes, oh yeah, that's a great idea. Um, and it's great to kind of throw, I kind of use chat as my sounding board, right? Like I've got this lame, crazy idea of doing this. What do you think? You know, what do I need to like consider and, and kind of like yeah. work through some of that planning. Um, but I was using it to do a resume one time and I was just trying to, you know, throw in all these, you know, background things. And it actually hallucinated and said that uh, the candidate was a former CIO at um, the Marines or something. And I was like, and that uh, he was fluent in Japanese. And I thought to myself, I never said that uh, he spoke Japanese. I never said that that was a position that he had once held. I'm like, where did he po like where did it possibly create that? Yeah. And it turns out it was because there were a couple of billets um, from the candidate uh, wherein he was in Okinawa. Um, he did consult with the Marines um, and he has consulted at the CIO's level. So of course, like he hallucinated and says, yes, you are the former deputy CIO of the Marines and you are fluent in Japanese. So nice. That, that was, <laughs> yes, that was very, very far off. I was like, wow, that that's an example I'm going to keep in, in my bucket here because People need to know this. People need to understand. And, and, you know, like it's very I think we're hearing more and more about hallucinations. Um, and now that people have more time to kind of experience um, and, and kind of share their uh, success stories and their, you know, challenges with it, where I think we'll we'll hear more and more of that. And hopefully more people will uh, verify what's coming out there. Um, but, you know, you, you mentioned the notion of having a champion to guide you through this adoption process. And I think that's so important. Um, it brings a sense of like ownership and accountability, especially given like the AI evolution pace. It's such a rapid pace right now. Um, how do you think organizations could effectively identify and empower like these internal quote unquote champions to navigate through this adoption, you know, like voyage? Yeah, it's, it's a great question, and it's just a thought process. Um, from my standpoint, I think the idea of having a champion internally in any enterprise organization is critical to any 
a significant kind of behavior change process with automation. Um, what are the characteristics of that champion? That's a great question. The person needs to be, okay, well, firstly, it can't be a part-time role. And this is a huge issue, right? A lot of times it'll be, well, I got my day job, I'm, I'm whatever, and I'm supposed to be doing this secondary job, which isn't really being empowered to actually deliver anything significant. So the person has got to be more or less full-time on this. The second element of that person is that they need to have a combination of two skills. One is effective communication, and the second is effective or effective enough understanding of tech. They don't need to be a deep dive tech person. They don't need to be a, a dev person, but they need to have a logical disposition. That's a tricky mix, uh, an effective communicator with good logical talent and skills. They are around. You will find them. Uh, I think biasing towards a younger person, not to be ageist, and I'm not exactly spring chicken myself, but I would certainly bias towards a less aged person. Um, not because they don't have the capacity, they certainly could, but they're probably towards the back end of their career. They probably don't have enough energy to kind of push it through because it requires a lot of energy. It's effectively an internal consultant role. And you're liaising with a lot of different teams. You're trying to do a combination of business modeling. Uh, you're trying to do a combination of kind of education, get people on board, uh, understand the tech landscape. So there's quite a bit going on in that role. It is not a part-time role. It's a full-time role. It also can often be thrown into the kind of PMO program management office. That, in my experience, has been the kiss of death because a lot of that office or those offices can often be unempowered and they don't have any kind of real clout in an organization. So the reporting structure of the person, and there should be multiple of these people in any organization, the reporting structure is important. So they need to report more or less, I wouldn't say directly into the C-suite, but certainly one to two steps max away from the C-suite because that gives them power and they will need to bring people along the journey. So they need to have the ability to crack a whip every so often. So yeah. there are the characteristics that gives you success. You don't do that. You just waste your time. It almost sounds like a proposal manager, right? Uh, you know, if we an were empowered to proposal that. manager, an empowered proposal manager, and the, and the exactly. challenge with proposal managers is that they're considered, in many cases, a kind of a back office function. They're not considered as strategic as really they should be. Um, so yeah, I mean that challenge that you get where basically you've got an unempowered proposal manager—that's the doom situation. But when you've got an empowered program manager or, or proposal manager, excuse me, life is good. Yeah, exactly, um, and you know. Again, I've been I've been accused of being an ageist myself, um, but I I do love to work with you know certain um, certain professionals in a certain age group for certain things, right? Um, and I think having someone who is on the beginning of their career, um, they they tend to be um, really they're they're like a sponge, right? They're they're open to hearing. Um, and experiencing and trying and failing and trying and failing. Um, and they can see if you can find the right person who is very futuristic, yeah. like you said, finding someone who is a good communicator and technically speaking is really good and understands the technology um, and, and how the solution of technology is going to fall, solve a potential problem. And having that future mindset, I think, is is such a powerful combination a lot of times when you have someone who is within an organization and they've been there and, you know, they understand that that person has their their value and their role in this whole process, too. They they know legacy wise, you know, some of the challenges that the organization has gone through, what works, what they need to do to kind of get, you know, to the end result, which is success. But a lot of times there's a lot of baggage. There's a lot of things they have to unlearn. And so there's a lot of negative type of conversations of, well, we tried that before. It didn't work. Well, you tried it under a different technology or you tried it under a very different set of, um, you know, um, the, the, the factors are, are a little different. Some of the, you know, things are it's, it's not quite the same scenario as, as maybe before. So, um, yeah, definitely having someone. It, I think it's kind of 
more difficult though when you're a smaller organization and you have some you you have resource limitations and so you do wear many hats um and i know that a lot of our you know our listeners are from small business um if they are a smaller business you know how can they do that if someone can't do this full time is it even possible for them to do, to do this successfully well small businesses are a little bit different in in their complexion. Um, Most significant decisions in small businesses are either directly or one step away from the CEO or the president. Um, Anything significant. So Mm -hmm. technology adoption is a significant question. So that president or or CEO needs to be involved in that evaluation. They need to be involved in the successful rollout. They can't just say, well, okay, knock yourself out, buy a tool, quote unquote, off you go. It, it, it's it's more strategic than that because what's strategic for a small business isn't necessarily the same for a large business. So it just depends. We, we deal a lot with enterprises, but equally we deal with a lot of SMBs. About a third of our customers are SMBs. Uh, a third are, are over a billion dollars in revenue. So it's, it's a wide kind of church. What I've noticed, our SMB customers do phenomenally well when there's vested interest in the solution and they understand what they're trying to get out of it. So it goes right back to the earlier part of this conversation, which is if you know what you're trying to automate, if you know that there's inefficiency or that there's potential massive efficiency, so you'd no longer have to hire the same people you thought you would have to hire, if you know that up front and you measure against that, then for sure that C-suite person, that, that person in charge will be all over that because it's completely in their interest. So it's a slightly different situation. In, in my context, what I was talking about earlier was in a very large organization, well, you do need dedicated resource. In a smaller organization, because you run faster, because you're juggling many more balls at the same time, as long as the C-suite is involved and leadership is involved, yeah. then you can get good outcomes. Exactly. So I, I think the other part of not only having a champion um, is important, but the communication, that's that's where everything breaks down, right? Is if you don't have good communications, clear lines of communication, clear lines um, within the organization and, and mechanisms for being able to provide um, communications. And uh, how, do, how do you think that the internal champions and, and all those kind of involved can effectively foster um, feedback? And, and how and what does that feedback look like for success? So that's a great point about the kind of feedback loop, uh, Tom. The the key point, and it kind of ties in with our previous discussions, when you do any kind of change management, be it in a small to medium business or be it in an enterprise, it is really important to have an understanding of how you're going on the actual rollout, how you're going on the actual change of behavior. And the only real way you can do that effectively and yield a successful result ultimately is tight cycles, tight feedback loops, situations where instead of considering, okay, we're going to roll this out and six months, in six months, we're going to see if it's working or not. Instead of that, you look at kind of two, four week increments and you just tighten it down and you allow yourself the ability to course correct. So it's kind of a fundamental tenant of, you know, an agile approach. I mean, in in the world of IT, we talk about agile approaches, meaning tight delivery cycles. The rationale for doing that is that you time box on a very tight time frame, and you check the results. You need to understand what results you want and you see whether you're in the right direction or not. And then you shift course as you need because life doesn't work in a static way. So it's not like we have this master plan. It's going to take, you know, four months to conceive and then we're going to roll it out. It's going to be another four or six months and then we're going to see the results. It's much more, okay, the first month is, What's our initial place that we want to see change? If a, a tiny sliver of the overall objectives. Let's measure that. Let's course correct as we need. Let's get people involved. And that's an entirely, you know, it's, it's, it's completely dependent on effective communication for the, both the coordinating party and in a large organization that's a dedicated person in a smaller organization that's going to be a part of the C-suite in some way. It'll be a part of their status, their weekly status calls. Okay, we bought this software. We expected it to do X. Is it doing X? 
who's supposed to be using it? Are they using it? Have they been trained on it? Are they getting the results we thought we would get when we actually signed off on the purchase order on this and the investment? Because if you don't do that, and we, we have examples where customers, and it's befuddling, it's, it's crazy. They buy our software and they pay no attention to the post-purchase point. It's almost as if like they believe it's just going to magically work on its own. It isn't. And if you don't have your people using it effectively, and, and we spend a lot of time and energy you know, having our staff, our customer success staff, uh, working closely with our customers once, once the software is bought. But if, if you can't get that engagement on the other side, it's a waste of time for all concerned. It's like the old phrase goes, you can bring the horse to water, but you cannot make the horse drink. And right. in this case, we see it, and it's, it's a very strange thing. You wonder, why would somebody drop X thousand dollars on a piece of software when they're not going to actually give it a fair crack at actually being successful. And that is right back to that whole idea of how do you do successful change in behavior? And that is predicated on a huge, to a huge extent on effective communication, both internal yeah. and external. No, exactly. Um, I, I've seen it. I've experienced that adoption challenge myself. Um, but, you know, I love technology, so I'm willing to kind of try it and test it. But uh, again, I wish I would have a champion sometimes to be, kind of help me maneuver that. But um, it sounds like this champion actually, like I, I'm a huge um, superhero fan. So I don't know if you know this, but my son, Henry, he and I are Marvel, uh, DC Marvel, right? Uh, superhero. So we like, I, I love all the superhero movies and whatnot. But if you had one superpower to ensure that organizations seamlessly could integrate and engage across organizations, what would it be? What's that one superhero power? Yeah. I think it's kind of the theme of this entire conversation. It's the ability for me to help other people communicate effectively. Communication is a single superpower. I would love to be able to imbue upon teams of people. Well, there you go couldn't have said that better myself. So before we wind down and um, and close out this podcast, I, I want to kind of spice it up a little bit, right? This has been such a heavy conversation um, about something that is so exciting and new. So um, I'm going to put you in the hot seat a little bit, and I'm going to ask you to respond with just a sentence or a phrase to some of these questions. And um We'll just kind of sure. have a little bit of fun here. So um, today here, what was yeah. the first thing? Well, what was the first thing that crossed your mind when you heard the term artificial intelligence? So I first heard the term artificial intelligence in 1989, believe it or not. I was a computer science major and I thought really interesting. Wow, you get extra points for giving it a year or two. So um, <laughs> there you go. Um, I know our listeners know exactly how I'm going to answer this next question, but are you a morning person or a night owl? Morning person. Yeah. Never going to do that. So now I know. I ask Alexa every day, what time is it in Ireland? So that I know when to send my first messages before I go to bed. So um, I'm, I'm your night owl. So that's the reason why you see emails from me right when you wake up in the morning. Got it. Yeah. So, um, so what was the last book you read that reshaped your thinking? I have to confess. I have, it's been years since I've read a book. I'm absolutely a committed podcast listener. I consume all my information over podcasts. So I'm like, weird when it comes to books. So no books, podcast wise, tons, uh, in particular, you know, mandatory listening for, uh, people in my game, the all in podcast, which is basically a Silicon Valley type focus thing. Um, I love a thing called the rest is politics, which uh, over your side of the pond won't be as familiar, <laughs> but it's basically the former assistant to Tony Blair, Blair, a guy called Alistair Campbell and Rory Stewart, who's a former conservative, which is the opposition uh, party. They talk about a lot of topics and it includes technology. It includes politics as, as obvious, but that's where I get most of my learnings. Okay. Any eBooks or with that? No? 
very occasionally, but really honestly, it's all audio. It's, it's, that's where I learn everything. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting because my husband is a ferocious reader. He even still reads like newspapers on like his phone. And I was like, newspapers, do they still exist? Like, what are they? (laughs) He's like, wow. Um, And for the first five years of our marriage, he thought I was illiterate because I never picked up a book. It's like, no, I do read. I think I'm in that that category. Yes, yes. You and I are both illiterate in his uh, in his eyes, I suppose. Um, but okay, so if you could give um, AI a voice, what famous person's voice would you use? It would have to be Arnold Schwarzenegger. Really, I, I would love to hear this. Why? Because I was actually, funny enough, listening to a podcast, uh, Restless Politics, they were interviewing Arnold Schwarzenegger. I was really taken with his story and his his fundamental optimism is is really mm-hmm. infectious. So mm-hmm. I just kind of like that. It's more, it's less the voice tone. It's more the actual mm-hmm. attitude. Yeah. No, I would agree with you on that one. I like his voice. I, I don't know what it, maybe it's because we're on this side of the pond and we find all the accents on the other side so much more interesting than ours, except for maybe down here in Texas, y'all. Um, but yes, I could hear, you know, I could speak to someone at Visible Threat all day long just because of the accent um, over there. So for me, it's it's this ethic. But Arnold Schwarzenegger is really kind of interesting. There's... Um, there is a Netflix documentary about his right. life, and he's yep. very introspective. So it's very interesting how he's kind of looked back and his view on on things and how he, you know, whether or not you believe in his politics or not, um, yep. super interesting journey that he's had. So um, I'm a huge techie, and I love new, cool, shiny things. What's the coolest tech gadget that you own? I am going to disappoint you massively. I'm not. A gadget freak at all. Pen and paper is my belief system. No. I'm building software, but I don't I don't go for gadgets. Oh no. That is boy, that's that's very enlightening. I would have thought something totally different. Um if you ever need advice on a tech gadget, I have them all. The the coolest ones I will have and I will test and break. So um you can come to me for recommendations. There you go. I'd like to surprise. Like. There, there you go. So this conversation today has been so much fun and so enlightening. And here are some kind of key takeaways from our discussions for our listeners. Cool. Engagement is really critical to seamless technology and AI adoption. Be wary of those hallucinations in generative AI and then ask yourself, what is the right quote unquote job to be done? And the right internal champions are really critical when automating technology in, within organizations, whether it's AI, non-AI solutions, or, or both. So as we wrap up another enlightening episode of the Optimized Podcast, I want to thank Fergal McGovern for sharing his invaluable insights in exploring technology and AI adoption. Your expertise has undoubtedly shed light on actual strategies that our listeners can implement. To our listeners, the challenge lies in embracing the strategies discussed and identifying your organization's internal champions to drive tech adoption and to adopt AI correctively. It's about engaging and creating a culture, feedback, and continuous improvement to fully harness the potential for technology and AI. So that's a wrap, folks. Keep sharing, sipping, strategizing, and remember that the secret ingredient is a genuine connections and a glass of bourbon infused with a general splash of wit. 